afternoon again, everyone. For those of you who joined us for our live stream series last year, welcome back. If you're new to all of this, then welcome. We host this series for business leaders, people leaders in our community looking for perspectives during what is not just a tricky time, but it's becoming a long and, and tricky time. We know um, we know what 2020 was for a lot of us. You know, we had some uh, fortunate winners with business models, which you know worked or could be adapted. There were a lot of not so fortunate businesses impacted in a big way. 2021 was kind of eagerly awaited by uh, by all of us. Um, you know, here we are. Not not a lot has changed. In fact, for some, the, the situation has gotten a little bit worse. You know, at the same time, though, there are finally reasons for and, and good signs of optimism for lots of businesses as we look ahead. And, and so that's what we wanted to do to start off the year. You know, we're going to have a pretty close look at private business and the private business landscape in Canada. As always, we're fortunate to be joined by some really great guests. So today we have with us Debbie Fung. Debbie's co-founder of Yoga Tree Studios based in Toronto. You can probably guess the, the business that Debbie's in and the kinds of issues that she's working through right now. Adam Hill is also with us. Adam is a founder and executive chairman, LGM Financial. LGM provides insurance solutions for the automotive space. Also interesting times for Adam in that space. Debbie and Adam are both Quantum Shift alumni. That Quantum Shift is one of our flagship exec ed programs here at, at the school. They were both in class with Ivy's own Professor Eric Morse. Eric, uh, Eric and I go back a long way. Eric's the executive director of the Morissette Institute for Entrepreneurship. He's cross-appointed on the same topic at, at Western. Debbie and Adam, thank, thanks a lot. You, you say yes to us a, a lot and, and support us a lot. So th thanks for being here. Eric, thanks for, for doing this. We're, we're going to start with you. want to get a bit of a macro snapshot. You're, you're in touch with a lot of private businesses these days, big, big and small, lots of shapes and sizes. What do you see in terms of the landscape right now? Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, maybe just some data so to position this and then get into that a little bit. Um, I, I'm sure many of our listeners know, but uh, small to mid-sized enterprises and private companies, which is the bulk of those, uh, make up a huge portion of the Canadian economy. So 99.8% of all businesses fall into that category uh, in Canada. Uh, those businesses account for about 90% of all employment in the private sector. Uh, so a huge influence uh, on Canada, our quality of life. Uh, they account for over 50% of the GDP. <clears throat> and so we need these businesses. They're, they're what bring us innovation. They're what drive employment uh, and, and really you know, push the country in a, in a very positive direction. So uh, I think it's really appropriate. We're, we're speaking about those companies today and, and how they're coming through the pandemic. Um, I've been fortunate to be with Quantum Shift since, uh, since the beginning, and so we've had close to 700 people through that program now, and, and Debbie and Adam are both, uh, you know, have come through that program and, and I thought would be great representatives uh, with us today, and so you'll hear their stories in a minute, and I'm sure that'll be uh, more fun than mine, but uh, maybe just to paint the picture of kind of what we're seeing in that, <clears throat> I think, you know, we're all in this uh, as Canadians from a health standpoint, we're all in it the same way, you know, it's uh, life is different. Uh, for some of us, it's much harder than, than for others. And, and, and that's part of it. And that's part of what we're seeing in this pandemic is uh, that differential effect. And businesses are seeing it the same way. Um, about a third of all SMEs have revenue that is down 30% or more. A third, there's about a third that are, you know, kind of close to where they were plus or minus. And then not quite a third, so my numbers aren't quite there, but th there are a number of businesses that are doing quietly very well um, and, and just not as affected as the rest of us. And so they have different issues, making sure the mental health of their employees and, and how do they go about their work and, and their physical well-being uh, that we're all dealing with. But, but from a revenue standpoint, it's really hitting businesses differently. And when I talk about a third of all businesses you know, down 30% or more, that's different sector by sector. So you'll hear from Debbie in a little while, if you look at the arts, entertainment, recreation, tourism, uh, hospitality, you know, those businesses are down way, way more. And it's easy to understand why is government shut down, you know, those actual businesses, it, it uh, revenue uh, goes to zero in some cases. So there's a lot of companies that are that are really suffering through this. And uh, Debbie and I were laughing a little bit ahead of time, you know, don't say survived, say surviving and, and what the lessons are as, as we go through that. Uh, so we'll do that. Um, 
I really do see that split and in the network of the quantum shift companies that we deal with in terms of uh, how they're doing, probably more than 50% are down in revenue to some, some extent or another. Um, uh, but those that are in, you know, agriculture uh, doing very, very well. Uh, some infrastructure companies are doing well uh, also. I also want to say, you know, I, I think We've been fortunate in Canada. I think the government was quick to react. They rolled out a number of programs around rent, about employment. Um, they have some debt programs that are out there. And so we've seen less bankruptcies, less insolvencies uh, than say our neighbors to the South and, and many countries uh, around the world. Uh, I, I guess I have a little bit of worry uh, when we look at how much debt has been picked up by uh, the small to mid-sized enterprise uh, group about 75% of all those companies have taken on some form of debt. And I think I read uh, on average around 135,000. So, you know, as an average for these companies that can be quite significant. And so I'm not sure we've really seen the total effects of the pandemic yet. Uh, we may have pushed it down the road a little bit. Um, and maybe we can talk about that when we, we talk about the future a little bit more, Mark, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to our guests. Okay, thanks, thanks, Eric, and thanks for setting the stage. I, I had heard a few of those stats, but not all of them. Some of those are quite eye-popping, eye uh, not not in not all of them in a great way. Uh, Debbie, we wanted to um, but we wanted to come to you uh, first to tell a bit of of your story. Um, you know, in the in the space that you're in, uh, probably a, a fair number of challenges, and just wondering if you could, you know, sort of recap that a little bit, but talk also about kind of not not only how you're managing through it, but also what you're learning through this through this period. Thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, what a year it has been. I mean, um, we're about a month and a half away till we hit the one year mark since our first closure on March the 17th, 2020, when we're in the first lockdown. So um, just to give it a bit of a scale, um, prior to COVID-19, we run about 2000 classes a month across the five studios. Uh, we also had one studio that was about to be built and to be open in the summer of 2020. Um, like many small businesses, we did not forecast this to, to be like a tsunami and just kind of went downhill. Um, March 17th, uh, we immediately shut down all five of our operation on the back end. Uh, we stopped all membership payments coming out. So going back to uh, Eric's uh, remark on um, revenue going from, you know, a monthly flow to zero. Uh, that was quite rapid in the early months of March. Um, it was definitely an emotional roller coaster. I mean, uh, mentally, physically, uh, there's a lot to be done on the back end physically for many small business owners, but also mentally because you don't know what's coming in front of you. Um, back in March, uh, the government uh, stepped in to come up with some programs, including CEBA, CERS, which was known as CECRA, uh, the rent subsidy, and also the wage subsidy. Uh, but during that time, um, many small business owners were also pivoting. I think we heard the word a thousand times and, and I got to give respect to every single small business owners, whether it be you're making your own deliveries, whether you're going online for the very first time. And likewise, we did too. Um, I remember we did a very first Instagram live and we didn't know even how to turn on that, that, that story to go live. I mean, we, we were active on social media. We're active uh, to promote our um classes, but we're never really a online company. And what does that mean to small business? So for us, uh, it was learning how to, you know, do video editing, uh, filming, uh, everything that we had to do from audio sound, anything that that's not really traditional brick and mortar business that you have to learn in that short period of time, you, you just you just got to learn it. Um, so that was in March and uh, closure happened all the way till um, from what I remember till the till the end of July and in August. And at that time, uh, we were one of the industry that had a strict capacity cap. Um, we had to make sure that we only had no more than 10 people per class, uh, huge investment in PPE, uh, modification to our space, space planning had to change. Um, and that was all okay because we know that at that time, uh, all the business were still in this together. We understand that at that time, groceries were able to open, but we're still able to open as a small business along with other businesses. Um, come October, uh, obviously, as we all know now, uh, early October, we're, we're, we went into second mandated closure. And once again, restaurants, fitness, were also the first to be locked down. Um, you know, by, by the time reflecting back, uh, you know, just skipping 
from the lockdown October to now, we would be closed for more days. We'll be closed in 2020 than we would be open. Um, what does that mean to a small business? You know, you're almost a year in. You're now strictly relying on government subsidy. Um, you really have to make sure that um, after the one year mark, are you able to 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 really push yourself to further innovate? And how many of that percentage of your clients are ready to receive that um, from a from a traditional business model and pivot with you online? So this is where we are today, and uh, you know we really hope that better days are ahead in 2021. Just just one full up, Debbie, because I think it's of interest at least to some folks in the audience, and I'm not I'm not actually sure where we are. Where are we on rent subsidy for small business, and how like? Is, is that sort of a vital part of, of your your um, your current circumstance or something that you're not paying overly uh, attentive to? Um, for, for my industry specifically, um, there's two major um, um, expense and that includes wage and that also includes rent. Um, for us, we lease out some of the uh, highest traffic camp space in Toronto. For example, my Bay Dundas studio is about 10,000 square feet. I have another studio uh, just down the street at Richmond's Medina, that's another 4,000 square feet. Young and Eglinton, another 4,300. So all these space, um, because we cannot use them to the full capacity, rent subsidy, we are still committed as a tenant to make sure that we pay our landlords. Um, so for us, rent subsidy is huge. It really helps us get through this, um, at least together. Um, and for us, I think, you know, w w there's more programs coming out. As you know, uh, on February 1st, there's a, new comp there's a new loan called the Highly Effective Sector Loan which is for heavily impacted uh, sectors, including hospitality, ourselves, and also tourism to apply for. But as Eric has mentioned, our goal is not to take on more debt. We had enough debt that we had carried for the past year. And that's accumulation of the uh, top ups from wage, top ups from rent, and tops up, top up in, in general from utilities, from all the expenses that you have. And where does it bring us? Once everything opens, we are now gonna be committed as a tenant to continue to pay the regular rent that we have committed to prior to COVID. And is that enough for us to move forward, recognizing that foot traffic is no longer gonna be the same in Toronto like it was pre-COVID. Okay, Th thanks thanks for that, Debbie. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's that's quite the story. I know no, uh, no immediate end in sight, although lots, lots of lots of things on the horizon. I think to look forward to, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, Adam, I want to bring you in and, and get your story. I think I think the audience would be interested in hearing a bit more about your company and and, and sort of your background, um, different space, and also a different geography that you're in in Canada as as you're making your way through through COVID. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, for those on the west coast, good morning. I'm in Vancouver, and for everyone else, uh, good afternoon. Seems a little fitting to be having this conversation today. Um, as you know, Bell Canada has their Let's Talk Day today, um, annual event around mental health. And I, I can't help but think that, you know, for those that are on the call today, that uh, they're interested in understanding, you know, what is going on for small business, what other entrepreneurs are going through. And uh, we hope that this conversation does help provide, you know, some a framework of positivity, you know, and some relatedness, which I think, you know, all goes to, to good mental well-being. Um, because uh, as an entrepreneur myself, uh, you know, I can certainly attest to what it's like to have sleepless nights, worrying about your your other baby. Um, if you have a family, uh, this is just another, uh, you know, component of, of how, do, how do you manage your, your life and uh, I started LGM 22 years ago in Vancouver. Uh, we're a national firm and we kind of straddle the automotive and insurance sectors. So, you know, you can always find someone that's either done better than you or worse than you in life, I find. So in, in my case, I would say that, you know, when Eric was saying that there's this middle group of people that are kind of doing so-so, <clears throat> I'd probably put myself there as opposed to Debbie, which I have just a a ton of empathy for you know it's it's those sectors that are, are getting you know pounded by by lockdowns and not able to function um i can uh, only imagine that that's even you know, a greater hardship than what we've been through um but i will say that uh you know because we're so correlated to the automotive industry uh the early part of the pandemic was uh, was very shocking um in in the early months we lost like 80 percent of our revenue um as car dealers were, were locked down 
Um, we had to make some tough choices around, do we do layoffs uh, with our team or do we go to a reduced work week? And I'll tell you just a bit of background. In 2019, before this happened, we went through a restructure where we, we right-sized about 25% of our workforce. So that was already a bit of a system shock for us, something that you know was not fun to go through. So in many ways to go through this, it was just like one more thing that you know we had to sort of o- overcome and endure. Um, but perhaps the silver lining having gone through the right sizing was we had already kind of built a pretty resilient team. Uh, so we needed obviously to try and figure out a way to get through the pandemic in the early days. But when we asked folks to go to a reduced work week, it seemed like the fitting thing to do versus another round of layoffs. Incidentally, most of our customers went through layoffs. <clears throat> Auto dealers uh, for many months actually laid off their staff as a means of, of their survival. So, um, you know, we were able to sort of, you know, thankfully keep our team together. But uh, again, just I can appreciate that that wasn't possible for, for a lot of other businesses. But it was a very scary time, you know, not knowing what the future was going to look like. Um, I, I, I equate cash to oxygen for businesses. And, uh, you know, obviously a reduction in revenue um, was certainly one of the, the, the growing concerns. But then, of course, uh, you know, how many people can relate to this, but you, you might have made some sales. But then the, the question was, could those customers actually pay you? So we were running some receivables risk as well. So careful that you got some revenue, but, you know, was it actually going to come through the door in a, in a literal way with, with cash? So. Um, we, uh, we definitely had to sort of tighten the belt and, and make the best of available subsidies. I think we ended up with about 1.5 million in wage subsidies, um, which I'm very grateful for. And people, uh, as an aside, you know, like I, I, I notice people sometimes not always following the, you know, the stay at home, you know, requirements and so forth. And people have said, you know, why are you a bit of a stickler on this? Why aren't you, you know, maybe doing something in your backyard, even small I said, you know what? I got a handout from from the government, one point five million dollar handout for my business, and I don't think I should be, uh, you know, crossing the line where when when health matters, you know, if the government's giving me a hand and then they're saying this is what we want you to do to try and make this, you know, better, I got to do that, right? And I got to lead by example. So, um, you know, that's been my storyline for those that have said, you know, come on, let's let's go for a road trip. I'm like, I'm not doing it, you know, and this is the reason why we've all got to be following as best we can the protocols, uh, especially, you know, in small business when we've been able to get the, the help that we needed. Without the help, I'm not sure that, you know, we would be in a position to, to have this conversation, to be quite honest. Uh, we found the EDC uh, was very helpful as well in conjunction with our bank to being able to give us some debt. Uh, some financing, but, you know, similar to Debbie, we don't want to take on more debt, Um, you know, so we're really looking for solutions that enable us to grow our business without having to take on more and more load. Um, That's obviously important. But as far as, you know, where we see the business now, you know, although we're in that sort of middle ground because auto industry um, sales did rebound after that first quarter, there was some pent up demand late spring and summer. Um, But some of the issues we ran into was supply chain. So when everyone was in lockdown, so was auto manufacturing. So, you know, in the later part of the year, um, dealers didn't have the inventory that they needed, you know, to meet the, uh, the consumer demand. And so, you know, we're by no means from our industry perspective out of the woods. And, you know, even with the current lockdowns in Ontario and Quebec, Quebec is running at around, you know, 20% of normal sales in the month of January, and that looks like it will likely persist into February. So we've got to be very careful, but I think, you know, where we're learning now versus, you know, in the early days of the pandemic is that, yes, this is a marathon. We need to look at this with a long range view um, and to sort of make some assumptions around the business that I think, you know, we need to, you know, think about this as a, not only survival, but, you know, how do we, how do we thrive if, if there is, in fact, a, a new way that we need to look at the business. So we've de-risked a lot, you know, in anticipation that the next year is going to be, you know, it's going to have its trouble spots. Um, we've spent a lot of time, you know, working on the mental health and well-being of our team to make sure that, you know, the team survives and gets through this. Um, you know, there's a lot of temptation to move to another industry that's on the on the right side of the ledger right now. And we're doing our best to keep our team because when this is all behind us, we need the best team we can assemble 
to come out of this strong. And then we're also looking like others are and so many on the call, you know, how do you pivot your business? So we're looking for new channels, new ways to do business that hopefully offset some of the, the loss that we're experiencing in our core business. And most topical right now is, you know, when do we return to the workplace? You know, we did a good job of quickly moving to work from home, um, but now people are really getting fatigued. You know, the honeymoon's over for, for working from home for so many. There's a subgroup, maybe 20% roughly that say, you know what, I love working at home, but there's so many of the, the workforce that really miss the camaraderie, uh, re really don't like doing business at the kitchen table. Um, and, uh, you know, quite frankly, you know, need, need to get back to, to an office environment or whatever that may look like if they're in sales, you know, being out in the field. Um, so we're looking at that right now. How do we do a flexible work arrangement which I think is kind of the, the new way that things will happen. So there's some good that's coming from all of this, but certainly for us, uh, it's been a bit of a roller coaster and you've kind of had to hang on for the ride. Yeah, that's well, I think that's very well thought out. And that, you know, that point on the honeymoon and working from home, home being over, there was, a, there was a piece I saw in the paper, one of the head of the, of the big banks in, uh, in the UK uh, was quoted talking about that. And we, we've spent, a fair number of these webinars thinking about culture and the impact on culture last fall. So we won't, we won't go there for the rest of this one, but it is, it is a good call out. Uh, also just one note, one of the things that you mentioned early on was uh, it's Bell Let's Talk Day and there's a, a spotlight on mental health. So Sean's going to spin up the, all the links to, um, to the site and, and uh, to their feeds and we'll, we'll put them in the chat toward the end of, um, toward the end of this webinar. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, we've we've got a bit of a, a stage set. I think Eric, we want to come back to you. So now that we've kind of looked in the rearview mirror, we look forward, and there, you know, we we talked in the prep about there being a you know a fair number of signs of optimism, reasons for hope. You know, focus on recovery as a, as opposed to just getting through. And just w I wanted to get your you know what is your view looking forward for private businesses? You know, looking into twenty one. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think, you know, there is some good news, right? Uh, we have vac a vaccine now that seems to be very effective. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be all about how quickly can we get it out? Uh, how well do people conf conform to the regulations that are in front of us? And, and both of those things will work together to get us uh, through the pandemic quicker and, and back to something that's more like what we know is normal. Um, most economists are calling for really good growth this year, uh, you know, anywhere between three and 5%. But, but again, it, it's going to depend on, you know, again, how well we behave <laughs> and how quickly we can get those vaccines out across the country. And if, if we can do those things quickly, I think we'll be able to get closer to the top end of that. And if, if not, it, it may be a little bit lower. Um, but so that's some good news. Uh, what's underpinning that, I think, is pent up demand. Uh, of a lot of people, you know, Adam mentioned not traveling. I think all of us are, are feeling uh, either the want to get somewhere different or to go see loved ones, uh, family, you know, around the world. So uh, there's a lot of pent up demand for that. Uh, I'd just love to go eat in a restaurant and not worry about it, like enjoy it. Uh, you know, that's something. But there's $170 billion in savings by Canadians. That's a lot of money on the sidelines ready to to go towards something when given the opportunity and the ability to do so. So I think there's some good news there about uh, those companies that come through this and can make it through uh, and, and position themselves well to take advantage of some of those things. And like all disruptions create opportunity as, as well as, um, you know, misery. Um, and that opportunity, if, if you can, if you're a small business and you make it through this is, is looking around and seeing where maybe there's some now some holes in the, in the marketplace that you can step in and fill. Um, you know, one of the cautions that I often give to uh, the companies that I work with is that it's just human nature. We, we think that everybody's going through the pandemic the same way we are. Uh, so our customers must be feeling it very similar to the way we are. And, and in fact, that's, that's not likely true. Uh, they have their own issues. Um, uh, they may be just slightly different, but it's enough different that they're looking for different and solutions. And so we need to make sure we're checking in with our customers. Do they need the same solutions, you know, tomorrow that they did back in February, January, February of last year? Uh, or have they moved? And, and we need to be the ones that, that move there with them quickly. And, and I think we're positioned to do so, but we have to be, you know, willing and able. And, and the debt piece scares me a little bit. 
uh, for all the companies that have had to take on debt to survive. It's, you know, and I, I don't know what the government can do about this, but it is starting to create an, a playing field that will be a little bit unfair. Uh, I mentioned all the savings that's on the sidelines. Um, you know, what we saw in the States last year, towards the end of the year in particular, was about a 40% increase in new startups. We don't have the Canadian numbers on that. I assume it's going to be relatively similar. And going into this year, we're going to see a lot of new startups. We have a lot of people displaced from jobs. Uh, we have uh, folks with savings. Uh, and they're going to be looking at the market and saying, there's a hole there that I think I can fill. So uh, they're coming in without debt, perhaps, um, and a clean slate, cheaper rent, perhaps, than some of the incumbents are in there. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's really important for those uh, businesses going through this now is to turn their eyes to the future as much as you can. You know, I think both Debbie and Adam, have, 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 it's hard, right? And I feel for everybody going through this. But it's, it's critical that you start to look to the future a little bit and say, how am I going to get to thriving again? And what do I have to do to position myself uh, and my company to do that? That, that startup uh, piece that you, you, just, you just put forward is an interesting one. It's an interesting equity issue. You know, I, I, I thought, you know, three and four years ago when it was really, in the, I guess right until last year, really in the heyday, it was we got into this weird place in North America where we celebrated raising money more than we celebrated staying in business or making money in a, in a weird way. That's what got news and headlines. And it's it seems, and that's not to, I respect startups and they're necessary and amazing for the economy, but it, it does seem uh, like a bit of an equity thing if, if they've got a leg up on businesses that have been around and employed people a long time, paid taxes for a long time. You know, it sort of feels like existing businesses should get a shot at the startup space too, uh, in, in a way. Um, uh, but I guess we, you know, we don't want to turn this into a, a, a policy platform. Um, you know, Debbie, maybe we come back to you and say, I, I'd love to get sort of two views. We we talked in the prep, and lots of the businesses I talked to are in, still in optionality mode, right? They're almost in optionality exhaustion or uh, fatigue, fatigue. But in your in your most optimistic days and, and views and then your your ones that are less so how how are you looking at those sort of two streams of the future and navigating that yeah, that's a really good question i think the pandemic has led to widespread shock and disruption in all categories that have caused people to really evaluate really their assumptions um the routine and really what's ultimately important to them um whether it be health they reprioritize some of the things that they normally neglected um, looking at some of the stats in our industry, uh, we look at the wellness index report, and we now know that COVID, uh, COVID has really accelerated the adoption of just virtual fitness. Pre, Pre-COVID, we're at 12%. Uh, that means that amongst, you know, 100% of all the fitness and health uh, gyms, studios, clubs, there was really only 12% who was doing any form of virtual fitness. Post-COVID, we're now sitting at 40%. Um, asking North Americans, um, what was their, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, likelihood that you will try a virtual routine. Pre-COVID for them, it was only at 10%. And now you're sitting at about 55% according to the wellness index. That means that people are more open to new ideas. Wellness is still very important to them, but does that mean that, um, you know, going online, it's gonna be the right method. For us, it is an opportunity. In my most optimistic days, that is something that I, you know, reading these stats, it gives us hope. It gives us hope that, you know, once we're back to normal, wellness and fitness and health and mental wellness is here to stay. And there's gonna be a demand like, like we haven't seen before in the past 14 years. Having said that, we have to go through the hurdle to understand what would be the new normal be like. Is it a combination of both the uh, uh, a hybrid model? Is it a digital platform plus an in-studio platform? Um, in my less optimistic, I mean, my less optimistic days, you would think, are we still around to be there? Are we still going to be this kind of in-studio model at the end of this? So I think for us, um, we, we mentioned this a lot, uh, innovation is gonna continue to happen. Uh, innovating is defining something that you don't have to make a breakthrough, but you just have to change the way you operate. I think for us, we're not gonna reinvent what um, yoga is. It has been 
a, uh, a system, a tradition, and a practice that has been in place for thousands of years. We're not going to change that. We do not want to distort from that. But we understand that it could be uh, transformed. It could be uh, it could be presented. It could be executed in different in different ways. So I think for us, um, the future is going to be bright. Um, I always say it to myself, and no one's packing in the back. I pack myself in the back, and 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 motivate ourselves like any entrepreneurs that the future is going to be bright for us. Uh, recently, we partnered with Vimeo in New York. Uh, Vimeo is an online video yeah. platform company. Yeah, so so we are finding ways to connect to members, not just in Toronto. Uh, so we're now going to be launching as a Friday our own channel on all Android TV, Roku device, and uh, Apple TV. So we're now not just relying on Toronto market, we're expanding our horizon to, to more international market. Um, you know, we're finding ways to connect, we're finding ways to, to present ourselves, not just a local Canadian company, but present ourselves on the international platform. And what does that bring us? To be quite honest, I don't know yet. We might have three sales, we have 50, we might grow, grow mm -hmm. to an international company, but we're just trying different ways to stay connected. That, that's that's great. Good for you. Did they, did they approach you or did, did did you approach them? How did that deal come about? Yeah, yeah. So we approached them, and um, mm -hmm. there are some tech companies through through COVID journey that uh, we discovered that have really helped us with the transformation. Mm -hmm. um, back before COVID, we always looked to local companies, and we weren't very savvy with tech. To be honest, I'm just such I'm just a studio. I'm just a yoga studio doing wanting to do in in, in studio classes. But I think um, we're, we're discovering new ways to stay connected and finding tools that will help us. Vimeo is one for us for small businesses. Uh, we use a lot on MindBody. We're using FitGrid. We're trying different softwares to really help us. That, that's uh, that's awesome. Good for you. We, we don't know anything about tech here either. Thank God we have Sean. <laughs> so, we're all learning uh, every day. So <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Adam, sort of same same question for you is, is you look forward, Adam. I, I, I guess, especially through an optimistic lens, what are you kind of charting out and what are you planning for in 21? Yeah, just as a, a first, you know, Debbie, just hearing, you know, where you're looking for, for those rays of sunshine, I just get inspired and reminded that pretty much any business, I think, you know, if you think long and hard enough and you bring the right people around you, there's, there's ways to develop your business. And being such a local supplier and then now perhaps being a global player, like that could have a profound eff effect on your business. And uh, that's, that's the cool stuff I think about, you know, entrepreneurialism and, you know, like we've got to get through this first, like you said, and I think that's the key is make sure we've got the oxygen to, to survive, you know, the pandemic. But I do think that there is a future that can be very, very bright. And, you know, my, my father-in-law is coined as saying, you know, if something isn't negative, uh, don't don't dwell on it. Um, you know, stay positive. And if it turns negative, then try to make the most positive outcome of something that is negative. And I, I am the same way. I'm trying my best not to go down the, the rabbit holes of social media and uh, all the, the different opinions that are out there that, you know, arguably doomsday. Um, you got to look at what is right before you in terms of how do you manage your business effectively and keep your team safe and well, and have that that uh, that tinge of optimism that I think an entrepreneur just fundamentally needs in order to you know make a go of of, it, of a business. Um, if you're constantly dwelling on on the negative, I don't know that uh, you know you would have a very sustainable business. So the one thing I will say going forward though is that I'm encouraging our team to assume that nothing is what it once was. And you know, you've heard the, the, the proverbial new, new normal, but I look at it differently. And, and this is very important because, you know, I would use an example of, of a car dealer, which was, you know, a fundamental customer of ours. And a salesperson on my team would sometimes drive past the car dealership and I'd be like, hold on, like, why are we not stopping and having a conversation? Oh, well, they told me a year ago, they never want to see me again. And we get these prejudices, don't we, where, you know, something is, is, is locked and ultimately can't be, you know, opened up again. And, and we, we, we go to where the fish are, so to speak. But I would invite us all to consider, particularly because of this pandemic, that the fish are plentiful and what we once thought was a roadblock is no longer. And I say that because I need to be sharp with my own customers. As Eric said, I have to have my ear to the ground. I have to listen very acutely to what my customers now want because it's shifted. 
And then I, I'm going to assume that my competitors are perhaps not as attuned or perhaps, you know, are not as hungry as we are to, to make a difference, you know, for a prospect customer. And I'm not going to assume that what once was a no a year ago is still a no. And in fact, we've proven it time and again over the last six months. Hey, come on in. I want to have a conversation. And what better time when business owners uh, potentially are in lockdown to actually connect with them virtually and have a discussion around what the future could look like. So I'd encourage folks that are, you know, sort of perhaps, you know, at home, you know, not able to perhaps run the business the way you normally would, that this can actually be quite a fruitful, um, fertile time, you know, to actually reach out and, and, and present your, your value prop once again. And not to assume that once was was a decision is, is going to be perpetuated. I think business owners are all looking for ways to reinvent themselves, looking for new ways to make money and uh, and to, to get through this. So that's what I would say is, you know, don't assume. And then we're going to rely upon technology and service. They're going to be our levers of differentiation. Each of you will have your ways that you're going to set yourself apart. But I think it's really important for you and for your team to get really clear on what is it that's going to set you apart. We see in the automotive industry, technology is running at a very fast pace and we need to keep up, but we want to lead in our space. And I think, you know, that comes with opportunity. It helps keep our, our workforce engaged. Um, and then service delivery. If we can do it better than others, particularly in a virtual environment, um, and then that's going to create opportunity for us. So hopefully there's a few nuggets in there that, you know, sort of give some perspective on how we think we can get through this and come out the other side, perhaps hopefully a little further ahead than others. Eric, did you want to weigh in on that point? Uh, you know, not too much. I, I really appreciate uh, Debbie and Adam. I think both of you really gave us all so much to think about. And I, I, I don't want to be you know, Pollyannish at all. I know there's a lot of people that are going through a lot of hurt and, and a lot of businesses are not going to come out the other side of this. But, <clears throat> but I do have to say that, you know, just talking to the entrepreneurs that, uh, that I've been fortunate to meet uh, all across the country, I really think there's a huge opportunity for us here. And I, I know all of them are thinking just like Debbie and Adam about how do we build back better? How, how, do, how do we make this better when we come out the other side? And I really think in Canada, we have this, this great opportunity. You know, I, I think the government acted relatively quickly. They didn't get it exactly right, but they got it pretty well right. And and our entrepreneurs are not getting it exactly right, but they're getting it pretty well right. And they're looking forward to an optimistic future. And I think as we build back, we've got great opportunity and it's and it's led by, you know, folks like Debbie and Adam. So thank you guys. I want to get to a couple of questions that are in the, the Q&A that have come in from the from the audience. I've been sitting there for a few minutes. I thought they were good ones. Um, and we'll try and maybe address these as practically as, as we can, not as esoterically. So the, the first one says, uh, you know, have you learned any lessons that would help your business prepare for the next, you know, shock? And I, the way I want to interpret that one is, again, not a, that not in a philosophical kind of way, in a very kind of practical way. Are you documenting what's going on? Are you scenario planning? Do you, uh, I know I'm not right. I, I am firefighting to the, you know, to the day and I've not taken the time to step away from the business and say, you know, here are the lessons, you know, sort of here, here are all the processes and here are the things that I would, I would action again in the future and that I wouldn't, but I, I don't know if I'm alone on that or, you know, are you, are you finding the time to actually pull away and do that? I would say that, you know, we're still building our parachute while we're out of the plane. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we are looking at ways of de-risking, as I mentioned. So, um, you know, case in point, you know, we, we run an investment portfolio. Uh, the returns have been, you know, we've seen a return from, you know, the, the market crash. And, and actually in the last quarter, some pretty favorable gains. And we're like, you know what, we need to pull out of, you know, some of those more speculative uh, portfolios. And uh, again, cash is king. So there's ways that I think you got to look at the business and, and pragmatically de-risk, you know, so that, you know, if this does continue, that you're, you're, you're doing your best to sort of safe haven the business, um, you know, and then of course your people, I think, you know, that's, that's the big piece for us is what do we do 
to make sure that uh, our team gets through this in a, in a healthy way. Uh, I don't think anyone can quite predict yet what the, the ultimate toll will be around mental health, um, you know, as, as so many people are struggling, you know, with, you know, either business ownership or employees that have been laid off and so forth. Uh, we got to create psychological safety for our team to speak up and let us know when they're hurting and, and to create a space to be able to accommodate and help them as best we can. Those are the big things we're doing, de-risking and, and really wrapping uh, our arms as broadly as we can around our team. Uh, to make sure that uh, they're doing well. And, and the rest is, you know, we've got to just lay it out as it, as it comes. Debbie, how about you? How are, how are you and your, your top team? How are you operating these days? So we're all, we're from home. Um, but, you know, again, uh, mental wellness for us is huge. I mean, we live and breathe. That is a philosophy. That is um, our business model. Um, our concern right now is really um, who would be the first sector to be rejuvenated and going back to the market. That also means that um, unlike Adam, he does not have a capacity limit set on him strictly. For us, it's a little different, very similar to hospitality. Uh, not only do we have the capacity cap, we're also a community that really foster and promote in-person connection. These are in-person social interaction that you cannot it cannot be replaced on a Zoom or on a call or on a, on a video. Um, so for us, I think, you know, for, for us to really get through this, um, we have to understand, um, A, is there going to be restrictions that's going to come through? Are there going to be caps going to industry? And if so, uh, how long will these be in place? When can we bring our team back? And also, what would be the uh, ratio of us going back in studio? Is it going to be strictly work from home? We don't know yet. So these are all unknowns on our end. Okay, there's, um, so then there's another one. I, I like all three of you to take this one if you could. And so the, the question is, you know, every, uh, I'll just I'll just read it verbatim. Every business needs to be online, i.e. social media, website. Will every business going forward need to think about online, virtual, remote uh, as a revenue stream? You know, I, I do a little bit of work with a, a company in, in Guelph, pretty old school. They make transformers, they sell them B2B. And even they're thinking they need they need to be on uh, their customers' phones. They need to be. They need to have a presence. And so they're thinking about. It. I'm just curious about all three of you, your views on this. Eric, you would you advise a fair number of companies. Is that is that a question you're taking on, or something you're you're addressing with the folks you work with? Yeah, I, I you know absolutely. It, it does differ industry by industry. There's some that are you know B2B. They know who their customers are, and so it's it's less so. But even then, there's an informational side and other parts of their business where they're trying to engage with their community that is much more digital than it's ever been. Um, but I would say even before the pandemic, there were a lot of companies that I've been doing some work with that were moving you know digital. They had to be omni-channel for those that are perhaps retail, uh, bricks and mortar, and uh, you know, like Debbie, seeing the opportunity, maybe we can be more global rather than just local. And what the pandemic did was just accelerate that. And Mark, you think of our business um, in education. We, you know, you go back last January, we were having cute discussions about maybe we should be more online in the future. <laughs> you know, and three weeks later, we're online only. Uh, and, and at the time in January, we would have said, no, we could never do that. Well, we did do it and we did it rapidly. And, and you know, businesses are doing things today they would have never imagined. And, and now it's how do we leverage that going forward? We're gonna have an opportunity to go back to maybe more of the bricks and mortar and in person for many of our businesses, but, but how do we hang on to those things that we've developed in that time frame and, and leverage them effectively? And I, I think, yeah, with few exceptions, everybody will be looking at uh, an online presence and hopefully an online, you know, production cap capability. Either Debbie or Adam, do you, do you have a view on this? Do you think every, literally every business will have some sort of online revenue stream or, or an online presence? I think for us, we have to recognize that potentially a third of our members or consumers will never come back, whether it be they have pre-health conditions that doesn't allow them to come back. Uh, there's still going to be a prolonged fear factor involved or anxiety level involved. So we have to be, uh, you know, finding ways to stay connecting with them. And that also means that, um, you know, instead of, um, you know, someone who's going to be coming out to practice yoga, for example, three times a week, 
every single visit that they step out from their house is going to be more purposeful. That means that they're going to reconsider the risks involved coming out. They're going to reconsider, is it, uh, is, is it worth me to come for a trip to do yoga? So we are going to be pivoting our company to digital, and that is going to be a core aspect of our business, and that's here to stay. Um, it's just because we understand that consumer patterns have changed, consumer demands has changed, and their consumer behavior has changed drastically post-COVID. And I'd say uh, in the automotive industry, um, consumers more and more are wanting to be able to have the, the buying experience online. I think uh, we all know that Tesla kind of trailblazed the opportunity to order a vehicle online. And a lot of the automakers are starting to play catch up and, and make that available. And so we, from a, you know, a complementary um, ancillary product perspective, want to enable consumers to learn more about um, the, the, the buying experience of, of protection products as well online so that if they are going to buy, you know, end to end online and have the vehicle show up at their doorstep, that they've had an opportunity to consider how to best protect their vehicle uh, without having to step foot into a showroom. And so, yeah, we're a little bit late as an industry to the, to the plate, but I think that that's ultimately consumer behavior and, and expectation is that we get there. And so that's what I kind of was alluding to earlier is that we do need to, we need to be in the technology space. And, and, and it's my perspective that if you have to be there, you can either sort of be dragged there or you can, you know, lead, you know, and so that's the, the position we're taking is we want to be one of the pioneers and, and do it in a way that's really inspiring for consumers. So that's, I, I get accused of being a grumpy old man practicing early a lot and uh i have i have no desire i have no desire to buy a car online or do yoga in front of the tv or uh eat a steak virtually so eric and i will go to a steakhouse when this is over and debbie i'll come to your studio and i'll go, I'll go buy a, a car for real for you for you for you adam um uh i guess you know one more that we we wanted to get to we, we don't again we're not trying to make this a soapbox or a policy platform but just it, as you look forward at the supports that you think are going to be required required for private businesses in Canada, with a, a, a sort of reasonably balanced view. Right, we can't tank the economy to do it. We can't put businesses too deep in debt. What what is, in your view, what sort of a reasonable path from here for say I don't know six six months or so of twenty one until we until we get to a vaccine? What what's our reasonable support system from the government for for private businesses? Adam, have you have you, have you thought this through? Do you have a view? I think that as much as possible, we need to let small business run. Um, that's you know, that's the engine, as Eric talked about. It's, it plays such a significant role. So, I understand you know curfews and and uh, and that there needs to be some restriction. But I think one of the most extreme measures of of actually forcing folks to close, you know, really needs to be moderated. And as much as possible in the next six months, if we want these businesses to survive. Um, we need to sort of, you know, create safe ways for them to continue to operate as much as possible. Um, and I know that's not an easy, you know, issue, you know, to resolve, but, you know, that is the engine of our economy. And we need people that are able to work, you know, that they are actually, you know, earning a livelihood. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, you know, continuing to support small business with, you know, available funding. Um, you know, we hope that that doesn't have to persist for too much longer because I, I worry about future generations and, and how do we, you know, pay, make good for all this debt. Um, but certainly, you know, those that need it most, like, you know, Debbie's business, uh, you know, hospitality, et cetera, um, it'd be good to know that, you know, there is some, you know, further support for them until this thing truly is, uh, you know, behind us. Debbie, what, what about you? What, what do you think is reasonable from here for? Yeah, and I find that, you know, just echoing what Eric has said, I've, I'm very grateful for all the support I've been getting from the government subsidies, whether it be rent, whether it be uh, CWS, or even just in general, those extended loan credits. Um, having said that, uh, moving forward, I believe there should be a sliding scale. And that means it's going to be by industry. We've heard on the news that there are, you know, companies who are on the public space that have been profitable and giving of dividends, but who are also on the wage subsidy. Um, so in, in that case, you know, are these companies, you know, going to be the, the ones that most need the wage subsidy? Um, for us, moving forward, I also don't want to carry that for generations to come. 
Um, but we have to be more mindful, whether it be like an auditing team or someone to verify who's the most heavily needed sector to go forward with this, whether it be a six month program that we continue to support these sectors, the ones who have been uh, highly disrupted or highly affected, these are gonna be eight months program, 12 months program. But right now the program is open to all and for everybody. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, there are some that don't need help and some does, but there has to be a refinement in program offering so that we're not going to continue carrying debt for Canadian, which is not going to be payable for, for generations to come. So. Yeah, that's, that's reasonable and, and thoughtful. There is some, you know, at least in Ontario, this, I guess there is some precedent for not treating, uh, everyone equally right the regions are sort of treated in in different ways now depending on case numbers and so you see a, a little bit of a creep on precedent there perhaps you know perhaps it could be extended the way you've you've suggested i, I don't know eric you talk again you talk to a lot of a lot of businesses is, is there anything that that you're hearing that you would you would either advocate for or you'd put forward and think is a good idea um <clears throat> i guess uh, just a little bit to follow on uh, to be honest i i think the best thing we can do is open the economy um that said, with all the health mm -hmm. issues uh, that we have, sure. we can't do it just immediately and across the board. Um, but to be honest, if, if I could wave a wand, what I'd really say is, you know, the government, the biggest help they can get, get more vaccinations and get them into the arms of Canadians uh, so that we can open mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. Um, I think that's going to make the biggest difference. Um, beyond that, we have forced certain industries to basically shut down. And I think that's where we have to give more thought uh, to how are we going to help those companies through those industries through. We have three third generation restaurants that, you know, uh, their, their livelihood is, is gone and they may not be able to reopen uh, when we get through this. And I, it, it's through no fault of their own, right? It wasn't that they were poor cash managers. It wasn't that they were making, you know, bad decisions. And in the most, for most cases, they weren't living extravagantly. They were living within their means and supporting generations and, and lots of employees. So how do we deal with that? And, it, and it's not more debt. Uh, I just, that, that part really worries me. The, the forgivable loans where we're employing people and, you know, some of that might make more sense, but, um, you know, where do you draw the line? As, as both Debbie and Adam have said, uh, there's, there's a lot of debt that we're, we're bringing up. So it, it's a tough decision. Um, and I hope we're giving it some really deep thought uh, at the policy level because, um, you know, it, it's going to be a fine line we have to follow. And, and let's give it to the people that really need it. Um, and those, in my mind, are the ones that we have forced uh, to shut down. Uh, it's a great response too. We um, just for the record, we we uh, we support uh, subsidized executive and leadership leadership training for uh, top teams. That's that's what we would uh, that's that's we would, what we would advocate for here. Sean, you've been paying attention to the chat and the Q and A. I think a little bit better than than I have. We have a few minutes left. Have we missed anything that we should be getting to? No, I think we've covered off a lot of the the main themes that came up in the in the Q and A and the chat. If there are a, a couple last minute submissions, we might uh, add those to our blog post. But I think there's one great submission from Barry that uh, that we could maybe leave it off with and ask each of our panelists, which is, what would your one line slogan be going into 2021? Um, any any final words around that? Uh, maybe we'll start with Adam. Yeah, sure. Put me on the spot. Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, as an organization, we are really rallying our team to, to be there for each other. And so, uh, you know, it would, it would be something along the lines of, you know, like, let's do this. And the idea of let's meaning like as a, as a community, let's, let's make sure we, we find a way and, and get through this. Uh, we need to be strong, we need to be resilient, and uh, we need to do it together. That's kind of the rally cry is let's do this is kind of the way we've been you know, positioning a number of our working sessions with our teams. Great. Debbie? Um, I'm just going to go with go with the flow. Flow meaning not just your yoga practice flow, but just go with the flow with whatever the government throws at you. I think for our industry, we, we've encountered a lot this year. So I think, you know, every time we get a capacity cap, we get a mandated closure within a, you know, 12 hour notice or 24 hour notice. 
you can't really fight against that. And I think you just have to have your mindset to go with the flow and just let it go, really. I mean, if you're going to fight against whatever is coming at you as an entrepreneur, you're going to be carrying a lot of weight, weight that you can you shouldn't be carrying. Why don't you just focus on on your growth or, or your digitalization of your company? So I think that would be our slogan for 2021. <laughs> there we go. We'll look for your so new tag it. on your website today. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, okay. a couple of you. It's a that's a tough question, Sean. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm not sure. Slogan. You know, I if if I can combine some things, I'd say it's let's look forward with optimism, but let's rely on our our peer groups um, or our communities, as Adam said, and and not be afraid to reach out and not be embarrassed to reach out. Um, and let's let's help each other through this because I think we can. We can build better. That's the, I think that's a that's a pretty good final word. Uh, Sean, can you uh, just wrap us up technically, remind the audience what happens from here, and and maybe get those links to uh, to Bella. Sure, absolutely. So we'll be sending out an emailed link to the full live stream recording uh, on our YouTube channel within the next few days. You can also follow us on YouTube or your favorite social network to get notified of all our latest content. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And uh, Mark, would you like to say a few closing words while I post those links in the chat? Sure. Thanks uh, so much to, to Debbie and to Adam and to and to Eric. Uh, really great, great session today. Thanks everyone who's tuned in uh, again and for and for all the support. We have you know a few more planned on the roster. We're going to be talking about corporate governance. We're going to have John Shell back. We hope to talk a bit about uh, private business uh, it, it, from a, a sort of policy standpoint and and a couple of others. So look for announcements uh, over the next few weeks about uh, upcoming sessions. And I think with that, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Again, thanks to, to, to all our panelists and to everyone who tuned in. Cheers.